All right, we're gonna get started here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Brian Cates. I'm the Special Events Manager with the City of Pittsburgh, and I thank you all for joining us here tonight as we observe Black History Month here at the City County Building. I would also like to thank Antonio Crows for the wonderful music to open our event. Okay, this year's theme, Early, Ameri Early African American Life, exemplifies the history of the transition from slavery to freedom, both nationally and here in Pittsburgh. Tonight we welcome Mr. John L. Ford, who contributed from his personal collection the great historical works and artifacts that are on display here in the City County Building lobby throughout the month. Mr. Ford recently retired from the John's John Hines History Center as a director in the museum's education division. Mr. Ford's retirement from the Heinz History Center was short-lived as, as he immediately asked to join the education team at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum as a part-time consultant and historian. He has taught African American history at two Pittsburgh universities and continues to lecture and create exhibits for museums, universities, and government and community organizations. We will hear from Mr. Ford shortly in regards to the items here on display for the month. I'd also like to invite everyone here with us tonight to enjoy some light hors d'oeuvres from first class caterers while taking a look at the display following our comments. And now to say a few words on behalf of the city and the contributions of Mr. Ford, I'd like to introduce our mayor, William Peduto. Thank you. Um, First off, I really want to do thank uh, City Parks. We have for many years celebrated Black History Month by recognizing certain individuals or industries or different types of skills or talents. Um, but I can't remember a time where we recognized the actual history of the African American community in Pittsburgh. Uh, this is a remarkable collection, to say the least. I, I was here on Saturday, and it had just been installed, and I had the time to quietly go through by myself and stop at each of the different uh, displays. And I can tell you that it's going to take a month to see everything that is here. But there's something else about this collection. There's a love and a care that goes in it that you can actually see. Uh, as we were, I had the chance to talk to Mr. Ford and he was talking about the frames. I said, the frames are beautiful. He said, thanks, I spent a lot on those. Uh, but you can tell it too. And the, the care of what was selected in order to be able to tell a story, it's very evident that there was a lot of time and a lot of thought that went into this. I asked Mr. Ford, I, as a historian, what, what percent does this represent of your personal collection when it comes to black history in this country and African history. And he said about 5%. So if you can imagine 95% more, I can't even imagine what type of storage area he must have to be able to hold it, let alone just the immense value of that history. So uh, there, there needs to be a way that we preserve this, we provide a way to find a place where it can be shown to the public, where we can use it with Pittsburgh Public Schools, and where this incredible story of Pittsburgh and black history can be seen by all they call Pittsburgh home. Uh, I have a proclamation that I'd like to read to thank Mr. Ford for this, but really this is uh, only 5% of what he needs to be thanked for. Uh, the true thanks goes to somebody who committed his life to make sure that we don't forget and that there is a place where we can see our past and know our future. Whereas John L. Ford is a native of Pittsburgh with family roots in Charlottesville, Virginia, he believes in strong family ties and proclaims firmly that knowledge equals courage, dignity, and vision. And whereas throughout his professional corporate career, 
Mr. Ford has independently studied and researched African and African American history. His studies progress further and examine areas of genetics and anthropology that give a full, more full understanding of African history. Enlightened by these studies and works, he aggressively pursued and procured collections of coins, documents, maps, and other artifacts that authenticate the essentials of ancient as well as contemporary black history. Whereas Mr. Ford recently retired from the Senator John Hines History Center as director in the museum's education division. However, that retirement was short-lived. Mr. Ford was immediately asked to join the education team at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum in Oakland as a part-time consultant and historian. And whereas Mr. Ford is an active collector and preserver of history, with many artifacts that date back to 2500 BC, alongside reference materials which document black history for more than 2.5 million years. His collection is known to be one of the largest in the nation. And whereas the city of Pittsburgh is honored to host a few of those artifacts from Mr. Ford's remarkable collection here at the City County Building in recognition of Black History Month. This di display chronicling some of the remarkable moments of black history here in Pittsburgh. Now therefore be it resolved that I, William Peduto, Mayor of the City of Pittsburgh, do thank John L. Ford for his remarkable generosity to the people of Pittsburgh, furthermore declaring Tuesday, February 5th, 2019, is John L. Ford Day here in our most livable city of Pittsburgh. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Would you please come up and say a few words? Well, thank you so much. I feel so very, very honored. I really appreciate that. Uh, when you work all of your life to meet certain objectives, and when you find that that work is valued, it makes you appreciate it much, much more. So I started collecting when I was a young man, 16, 17 years old. And I didn't stop until, well, I, I guess I haven't really stopped, but I've slowed down, that's for certain. And uh, that slowdown period came in, in the uh, 21st century. So thank you very much. Am I supposed to speak now or? Oh, really? Okay. They're giving me the mic. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate a, n a nice turnout tonight. I appreciate that very much. And I want to thank the uh, city of Pittsburgh for actually inviting me to share with them my collection. I appreciate just the honor of being here. And I appreciate all of the individuals that I worked with in order to get it here. What we did is we put together an exhibit in 25 to 30 days that it would normally take a museum a year and a half to put together. Everything that you look at is a primary source document and individually framed. And you might notice the letters on some of the documents, they had to be put on by hand. And I thought that added a, a fairly nice a fairly nice touch, a nice approach. But it was very difficult. So I'm very, very tired. So I'm gonna go home and sleep probably for two days <laughs> after this is over, but at least it's warm. Now last week, it was so cold. Where's uh, Brandon? Brandon, what's happening? Brandon was my main contact with the city of Pittsburgh. Give him a hand. He really helped me out. And the gentleman next to him in the same department, well, there were four or five of them, and I don't know where they are. 
but they were all very, very helpful. But uh, Brandon picked me up at home on Thursday. Th it, was, it was so cold. I was worried about my pipes busting and everything else. And then, then too, that night, it was Wednesday night, I couldn't believe how cold it was. But I was trying to get some rest. And on my back porch, there has been a raccoon that's been trying to get into under my um, drain pipes. I looked out the window and he's pacing back and forth and jumping up and down. I didn't have my glasses on, but I looked and looked like he had a sign. And I looked closer and it, it looked like it said, help. <laughs> I said, what do you want? Then I could see need, but I couldn't make out the rest. I put my glasses on. I thought he was going to say, need food. He said, I need a blanket. <laughs> I'm just joking. But I did wake up in the morning and looked out the window and I saw the squirrels. And the squirrels had boots on. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. OK, let's get serious. I like the joke. I was lecturing up in Erie, PA, maybe four or five years ago. And we had similar weather that was chilly, very much like this. Okay, my collection, well, let me tell you where I started. Um, I came up during the civil rights movement of the 60s. I graduated from Westinghouse High School in 1964. And I do have one frame here of Dakota Staten. She graduated in 58. But we all came out of Westinghouse. But um, we were revolutionary to the point that we no longer wanted to be called Negro. We wanted to be called black. That was our main thrust. So we were black. And at the same time, between 64 and 70, Africa, who had been colonized, the whole of Africa was colonized, they were becoming independent. And I do have a frame here for Jomo Kenyatta, who became president of Kenya. And you, might, you will be able to see that frame. I think it's on the second shelf on the bottom. So we came through very, very trying times. We passed the uh, Voting Rights Act in 1965. We had the March on Washington in, in 1963. All of that in the 60s. And that made me say, I have to preserve our history because it's not being kept and I want to make certain that I keep it and most importantly, I wanted to be certain that what I was learning about our history, I wanted to back it up with what I call primary source documents. In other words, it's not just what somebody said or what someone wrote in a book. I want to see the actual document. And that's what led me to collect the things that I collected and to test the things that I collected. It's one thing to collect things that are pretty much on par with what you think you know. But the biggest thing is to find documents that test what you know. You want to challenge yourself so that you know what you're saying is true. And I've done that for virtually every document that I have. Challenge yourself so that you know that that's true. Okay, I was going to take you a little further out. Do I have time? Of I do. Okay. All right, so that was the 60s. Oh, by the way, I should mention that when I graduated in 1964, and I always had a job when I was a kid, that was when Homewood Avenue had Firestone and SNS shoe stores and Penhurst Fruit Market and <laughs> Homewood Avenue had everything. You could do your Christmas shopping on Homewood Avenue. But um, I worked on Homewood Avenue. After that, I worked for uh, American Laundry and Institute and Misco department stores about six months, months each and for a butcher shop in the Hill District for about six months and decided I wanted to work downtown. And I became the first black to work at Gateway Center downtown at Harbison Walker Refractories Company. They had never hired a black. 
Now, the Civil War was over in 1865. It took them until 1965 to hire a black man in downtown Pittsburgh. Can I get an applause? Yeah. Thank you. That, that, that amazes me. It took 100 years to do that. But I showed them. I did well. And I left Harvard's and Walker Refractories Company and started for Mellon Bank. It's now called Bank of New York Mellon. But I started for Mellon Bank in the National Department, and I was the first black man to represent Mellon Bank on the road. And I traveled three states, places like St. Mary's PA and Lock Haven PA and State College and Eldred, West Virginia, Weston, Buchanan, West Virginia, all over the place. Some of these places had never seen a black guy. So if you think I'm a little militant, you'll know why. I went through all of that. And I can't tell you how many things I was able to see. Let me share just a little bit of, of an educational format, if I can. Uh, I would really like to go back about two and a half million years. I have a skull of a black man out of Ethiopia. I wanted to bring it and show you that we were homo sapiens sapien 2.5 million years ago, walking as a biped, walking straight up. That's a fact. I wanted to show that to you, but I thought it would take us too far away. But I'm gonna take you to a place that some of you might not wanna to go to, but I, I hope you understand that we need to understand this enslavement thing. We have to understand it. Why did it happen? And every historian that you know, you always hear them say who, what, why, when, and where. That, those are the questions that need to be answered for any historian. I dwell on why. That to me is the biggest thing. Why did this happen? Why didn't enslavement happen? Well, let me tell you what happened. Don't close your ears, white folks, I like you. Why did it happen? 1350 AD, Europe was going through the bubonic plague. You may have heard of that. And the bubonic plague wiped out about one-fourth, as a small estimate, of their population. A high estimate is one-third. They lost so many people during the bubonic plague. And you can Google this, look it up. And then at the same time, there was the introduction of the gun from China. That's a bad combination because aggression came out of Europe at that point, along with the gun. And then very briefly, to speed it up a bit, we have Christopher Columbus who embarked upon or who sailed what he thought was towards India and ended up in the Bahamas, right? We know that story. And Vasco da Gama was looking for a better route to India. And he went around the coast of Africa from the east coast to the west coast and did find it, but uh, they didn't want him. Anyway, we learned in school that that was the age of discovery. No, it was the age of horror. I'll tell you what happened very briefly. In North America, South America, and the Caribbean, we had about 90 million people die because of this encroachment from European nations. And I'm talking about people like, even in North America, the Iroquois, the Apache, the, the Blackfoot, the Cherokee, the Mohawks, all died. All, all through the Caribbean, I'm talking about Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Haiti, and Saint Tom, all of the Caribbean islands, and South America, all of Brazil in particular, they had more enslaved Africans than we had in America. So, 90 million people killed in the New Americas, and about 35 million Africans were enslaved or died because of the enslavement of different nations. And I do say nations. The people who were enslaved were citizens 
of different nations like the Yoruba and the Ibu and the Ashante. Can't call them tribes. Look up the population of Portugal of 1800. They had 1, 300 people, 1, 1, 300,000 people. Look up the population of Congo, 1800. They had 35 million. So why are you going to call Congo a tribe and Portugal a nation? Do you understand what I'm saying? I know this gets tough. But we have to be tough in order to identify our history to the extent that we understand it, respect it, and then we can start getting along together. Right now, we're, getting, we're not getting along too well. And I want to do what I can to help make that happen. I think we need to get along. We're all here. We're all in the same boat now. So let me share with you. I, I did write something. If I can find it. Oh, here it is. I have a um, display. It's about two exhibits over. It's a black man that just fought in the Civil War. And there were 189,000 blacks who fought in the Civil War and 8,900 from this area, from Pennsylvania. We fought in the Civil War. But this black man that I have in the exhibit, and I'm going to stop after this so you don't put me out of here. I'm going to take my proclamation and go home. Do, do I get a key? Do I get a key to the city? I won't steal anything. I, I, I might change a few tax records. Yeah, give me a key. I'll, where's your tax department? <laughs> Okay, this is the gentleman talking. He just left the Civil War, and I wrote this and I put it on Facebook. It says this, I fought the war and knew that it wouldn't stop this slavery thing. They were still privileged, so money and preference was in their left hand, and law and practice remained firmly grasped in their right. Even God is presented to us in their likeness. But if I can be honored with a good wife and children, and if they can hear my voice while bombarded with hate and greed and aggression, I will give them my truth and tell them my story. This will be my freedom. That will be my salvation. We will be home. There we will see no evil and feel no pain. Yes, this will be freedom. Me and you will really be free. I love you. You hear me and I hear you. Please color me softly, but please, please color me black with eyes that look into tomorrow. Cool? Thank you very much. I'm going to hold this proclamation Ooh. and let's write in the shadow of William Pitt. Okay. Same time. Mm -hmm. You gotta stare at all the cameras I know. at the same time. All right, one more. There. Last one. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. There's this, I'm gonna carry this for you. There's a right step right here. Okay.
Thank you, Mr. Ford, for those words. I want to take this time to thank you all for participating in this evening's festivities. Thank you to Mayor Peduto for joining us as well. And I'd like to thank Mr. Ford again for his contributions to this exhibit. I'd also like to thank the staff of the Office of Special Events who contributed to this work, uh, including Brandon and Maurice, who are the primary leaders on this exhibit, along with Julianne, Doty, Beth, John, and Jen, who are all here with us this evening. I'd also like to invite everyone to stay a while longer and enjoy some light refreshments and learn a, bit, a little bit more about the exhibit here and maybe share a few words with Mr. Ford. And I'd also like to thank, once again, Antonio Cruz for being here with us. Antonio will be playing some more music for us this evening as we enjoy the exhibit. Thank you again for attending, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Drive safe and have a pleasant evening.